Growing up poor in North Philly, Mark Jackson only needed to look to the ground to see where his next meal might be coming from. I think it was periodic of years, but I don't think I had a meal, a square meal. A lot of it was like candy because I find a quarter, I find a dollar, take it to the corner store and just get whatever I could, as much uh, food I could get for that. Yet somehow, he found his way to Roman Catholic High School, Temple, and pro basketball, including the 76ers. NBC Sports Philadelphia pre- and post-game host, Mark Jackson, next on Fresh 24. Mark Anthony Jackson, North yes, Philly born, Roman Catholic, Temple made, six year, six years of pro ball overseas, if my math is right, seven years in the NBA, two with yes. the Sixers, husband, father, broadcaster on NBC Sports Philadelphia, doing great community work with your foundation as a basketball coach and a mentor. Mark Jackson, Mark with a C, that's the right way to spell it. That's the only way to spell it, my well, friend. Well, I, yeah, but you know what? If you're on Google and you Google Mark Jackson, M-A-R-C, the other Mark comes up, the dude with the K, the, the coach, the broadcaster, the former NBA player. It's like, you know, he's like a Google hog. <laughs> That's okay. He just don't know how to spell his name, but it's okay. I tell him every time I see him, you got to learn to spell your name right. Exactly. <laughs> uh, Mark, what do you say to people on the street who ask you, When's Joel Embiid coming back? Um, I say in due time, in due time, but he will be back. You know, if he's, oh, is he coming back? Why should he come back? Because we're trying to win. And with the Joel Embiid, we still have an opportunity to win. All right. So we're taping this in mid-March. And as of a few days ago, Shams Charania put out the optimistic view on a Joel window of return call it late March, early April. Now, this isn't anything official from the Sixers. This is one writer with, you would guess, an educational guest. So I'm going to ask you, let's say for the sake of argument, he comes back April 9th. It's a home game against Detroit that leaves three regular season games and then the playoffs, not assuming any kind of a play-in tournament participation. Can the Sixers in that time ramp him up, gel the team, and be a force in the playoffs with that little of a runway? You know, that's a great question. You know, to be optimistic, I would say yes, you know, but as a person that believes tremendously in chemistry, it's going to be very difficult in a short period of time. You know, you need, I'm going to give it 10 games, 10 games to really get a cohesiveness together. But when you have probably the biggest, baddest guy in the NBA, if he comes back 80% of himself, 90% of himself, that's the top three best players in the NBA. So I would take and say that his skill level, along with his dominance and his presence, along with help from Maxi, Buddy Hill, Tobias, Oubre, those guys can get it done. By the way, happy 30th birthday to Embiid. That'll be on March 16th. As a fellow big man, take me inside his game. Footwork, thinking the game, whatever it is. What is it that we don't see with our eyes, that you see with your eyes, that you could tell us about? You know, the, the thing that Joel has that's so important to understand is his ability to create offense in many different ways. So that's why he's such a hard person to double. He has the power of Shaquille O'Neal. He has the footwork of the great Akeem Olajuwon. He has the, the shooting touch of, say, of, uh, of Patrick Ewing. So with those three entities, it's hard to define how do, how do you come prepared to double him, to stop him, to slow him down. It's very interesting on that note because you know hardly you can't do it because his ability to pass the ball, which has grown tremendously for the last few years, that's what's making him pretty much unguardable. Two years prior, you could have doubled him, could have forced him a high turnover games, but now his ability to see the game, to slow the game down, he's a hard-to-guard player. And important to understand that. He also is so cerebral when the way he picks you apart, the way he's able to do things. 
And it doesn't look like he expend, extends much energy, but he does just enough to get the win. Okay, we're going to talk more about the Sixers. We're going to talk more about you in your brief stay with the Sixers, about you at Temple under the late great Hall of Famer John Chaney, what it was like to play overseas. I'll take a story or two from that. But first, let's go back to the recent Philadelphia Catholic League title game at the Palestra. It was an instant yes. classic, your alma mater, <clears throat> Roman Catholic, <laughs> walking it off in overtime. Your two sons, Sharif and Sammy, are on the team. All right, be the proud father and brag a little bit, watching your boys play high-level high school basketball. You know, it was um, it was such a – it was like I was dreaming. I was sitting there with my mother. My mother was sitting beside me. It was – it was a dream. And let me tell you why it was a dream, because it was two games. It was two battles in one. It was Roman versus Archbishop Ryan, but it was also Sharif Jackson versus uh, Thomas Sherbert, who's going to be starting for Georgetown next year. Mm. It brought me back to my days when I was in high school where they said I wasn't fast enough, I wasn't big enough, I wasn't quick enough to play against Rashid Wallace, Jason Lawson, guys that had, went on to have great uh, collegiate careers as well as NBA careers. But every game I destroyed them. And you would ask them to this day, every game of high school, I got the best of both of them. And for me, it brought me back when Sharif versus Thomas was like me versus Rashid Wallace. Now, the good thing is Sharif ended up winning, in my opinion, both battles. But to me, I only won the one-on-one battles with Rashid, but he always ended up winning the game, which is more more important. So I was very proud of Sharif going against the best big man in in the East Coast who will be the starting uh, center for Georgetown next year, and pretty much showing how smart he is. Always knew he's a gifted kid off the court in the classroom, but watching how he picked players apart, watching how he picked the game apart, how he, he dominated the game on the offense and defensive end, it made me very proud. And then watching my middle son, Sammy, just sh- sweat confidence. Watching him step onto that court, and step onto that, that court when he was subbed into the game. I seen the confidence in him. I seen the aura around him. And it was I was like, oh, we in for a treat. So to see him pretty much be a great two-way player, the, the defend, blocking shots, scoring on both sides of the floor. And at one point, the coach like, give Sammy the ball, go get us a bucket. For a 10th grader, who's dealt with four straight years of catastrophic injuries Mm. in his 10th grade year to show up on the biggest stage and not just play well, but play with confidence. To me, that really did me proud. Mark, you're not only coaching your sons as many fathers have, but you're coaching them as a former professional basketball player. How does that change the Mm -hmm. dynamic at all? Well, it changes the dynamic because, you know, like like most fathers, once your children reach a certain age, they think they know more than you. And believe it or not, <laughs> it's, 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 it's a lot, it's a, it happens during his teenage years. And then they look back as adults and hopefully reflect and understood and understand the teachings. You know, it, it gets to the point, my sons are different. Sharif is always, okay, dad, yes, dad, what, how could I play better? What was your thoughts? Sam is like, I say, Sam, a good game. Oh, I know. <laughs> you know? So, so it, it's funny. It's funny that I, our kids are different, but you know, I look at Sammy sometimes like you think you know everything. Like, no, I don't. I just know more than you. Like, all right, I'm gonna knock you out. So, but he's a, he's a chop buster. He's like me. We have fun with it. But uh, it, it, the dynamic is, is a little bit where I have to sometimes remind them, like, I know you're good. But you got good for a certain reason, but that's not the ceiling. You have to continue to continue to build, not just the sports, but in life. You know, your spiritual beliefs and you as a human being. And then in basketball, you know, the student and the, the student part, they have that down packed full of them. It's just they got to keep reminding them that people come at them harder because of who their dad is. Mm-hmm. And I know when Sammy was younger, it used to affect him. It used to affect him a little bit because guys used to really come at Sammy. Uh, People don't really mess with Sharif as much as he's a lot stronger and bigger and muscular and stronger. So people kind of fear Sharif. But I know the mental game is important. I try to prepare them for the mental game. What do you think it's like for Bronny to follow in his father's footsteps, meaning LeBron James' son? You know, it's it's easy. He's the prince. 
He's the prince to the king. To me, I think, you know, I've had this argument with a lot of people and everyone has their opinion, but to me, I think LeBron's the best player of all time. And when you're the son of him and you're coming behind him in the same career that he has, it's a lot of pressure on you, especially him dealing with that cardiac situation, him bouncing back to play, you know, and he has fun. And I know he catches a lot of slack now because I'm involved so heavily in AAU around the country. I've seen him play since he's 13 years old. And he gets a lot of heat. People come at him, oh, he's not as good. He's not as good. He's getting hyped because of his father. That's not true. Bronny's a very good player. To me, Bronny is an NBA player because he does everything very well. He does everything very well. His IQ is off the charts. His, his number one feature is his basketball IQ. Then secondly, is his athletic ability. He can shoot it. He can get to the rim. He's a facilitator. But he's so unselfish. He's a pass first, pass second, pass third kind of guy. I know at USC they got to kind of play, got to play him off the ball because they missed so much time. But I think if he comes back next year, he'll be on the ball, and you'll see how much better of a player he is. Mark, you've been a regular on pre-half post-game coverage of the Sixers on NBC Sports Philadelphia. You're doing a terrific job. I, I have to ask you, when you're formulating your comments – do you tend to want to be more critical because you played or less critical because you played? Great question, Mark. I just, my main thing is to be respectful because as a player who played this game, some of the biggest irritations in my career and in the media is when I hear a, a talking head and I call myself a talking head in the media is when you say a guy sucks or we say a guy's horrible. And the first thing I said is, can you do anything they do? They're the master at their craft. But they are the master of the crap. So just be respectful. That's the biggest thing. My thing is, I just have to be honest. You know, I, I remember a few years ago, earlier in uh, one of the players' career, when, in my opinion, one of his coaches just kept making excuses for the player. And at one point at the uh, a playoff loss, I kind of went in. And I said, not talking about the, the coach or the player, but I said the reason why, because they felt as though the media was too hard on this player. And I said, the reason why the media is so hard is fair because you keep making excuses for them. And I said, so I kind of went in. So as I, and this is when Coach Cheney was alive and Coach mm -hmm. Cheney blew up my phone during a commercial. He said, Coach okay. White Mark, that was very aggressive. You need to make sure you got the back end of the hierarchs in NBC because that was very aggressive. And I went to the hierarchs. I say, look, I'm just speaking my mind and my opinion and what I believe is true. I'm not, do I, I, is that okay with y'all? Is that a problem? And he said, Mark, as long as you're speaking the truth, there's no problem. And that was it. So I just make sure I'm respectful, but I always speak the truth because before I became a pre and post guy for the Sixers, I was also a Philadelphia. Before I picked up a basketball, I was at Philadelphia. So one thing that I think the biggest thing to me is when I walk around in Center City with Philadelphia, because that's where I live, I the people know I'm one of them. I'm not just a guy who brought it here to do a job for a team. I'm one of them. And I know what they want. They want the truth. They don't want you sugarcoating. They don't want you lying. Don't you ever lie to them. They just want the truth, your honest opinion. And I give my honest opinion. Now, I will say, when I go, when the people in Philadelphia say, they, the, the people say, you're not hard enough. I'm like, I just speak the truth. I say, I'm never going to be disrespectful because that's not me. So that's why I come off. When you were a player, do you recall an incident where you thought a media member was a little too critical, unnecessarily so, and you may have confronted him after a game or at a practice or something like that. No, but I have a story for you. Go when for I it. played for the Golden State Warriors, and I was a free agent, and I was back here in Philly working out, it was one beat writer for the Golden State Warriors who called me and was like, they was calling me every day. What do you think? You're coming back? I said, well, I'm going to, I'm going to see what the free agent, um, free agency looks like, but I would love to come back. And he said this. He said, Oh, I just talked to coach David Collins. He said, he don't want you back. I said, what? He said, I just interviewed coach that he said, I want you back. I said, well, if he don't want me back, I don't want to be back. The next day on the front of their paper, Mark Jackson said he does not want to be back. <laughs> so now for, uh, truth, this is a true story. True story. Mark Jackson does not want to be back here. So then my, um, it became a tick for tack. Like Dave was calling my agent. Well, why is he being so negative? I thought we had a good relationship. And he's like, well, y'all talking bad about it. I said, we're not talking bad about it. So fast forward when I signed with Houston and then I got, they picked up, uh, they, they matched the offer 15 minutes before closing. 
<laughs> and I had to go back to Golden State. I was welcomed back to fill up by the fans with death threats. I would go out to eat. People walking by writing notes on my table with F you. We don't want you here anyway. Like when it be in pre during preseason. So then so Gary, the, the, the general manager of the town, Gary St. Jean, was like, you Mark, you know, why would you say you don't want to be back? I said, well, he said he don't want me back. He said he never said that. So what you mean? He said he never said that. I said, well, this guy told me that he never told he never said that. So I was led astray. And because I was young, didn't have much guidance, I guess, I, I took the bait. So fast forward to a week or two in the training camp, me and David Collins is not speaking because I thought he's telling talking better about me and paper. And all he says, I don't want to, he hear me say, I don't want to play for him. It kind of became a thing where we didn't speak the first four or five days of camp. But the one thing is what they say, Mark, man. So Gary St. Gary St. Jean finally told him what happened. And he walked and said, Mark, I didn't say that to you. I didn't say that about you. I wanted you. I love you. And I said, that's what he told me. Did you guys so, ever go and, back and confront the writer? We didn't. But check this out. I'm sorry, Coach David Collins was there. Coach mm-hmm. David Cohen was there. Mm-hmm. Back this out. So then I moved on three, four years five, after retire. I noticed he became like their sideline reporter. <laughs> and it was funny. Yes. And it was funny because I remember he had came here with them one time. And R- R- Raymond, their PR guy's named Raymond. And I told Ray, and mind you, because he created such a rift, Mark. When I went back, the staff of Golden State, people in the front office wouldn't talk to me. Like, it became a very toxic situation. So then I confronted him. I said, man, that was really screwed up what you did, man. He said, no, man, you missed it. I said, no, you know what you did. So it's interesting, uh, but that's what happened. So that's the story. All right. We're going to talk more about you, your time in the NBA, your time with the Sixers, and your time certainly with Coach Cheney. Uh, I have fond memories of all that stuff myself. But first... It is halftime, or the segment that we call halftime, and it is time now for our Garage Beer six-pack of questions. It's brought to you by Garage Beer, beer beer-flavored beer. Find some near you at drinkgaragebeer.com. Now, Mark, I'm going to give you a choice between a couple of things. Just blurt out the answer. Don't think about it. Just blurt it out. Are you ready? Here we go. Philly cheesesteak or Philly soft pretzel? Soft pretzel. Center City or South Jersey? Center City. Gritty or Philly Fanatic? Philly Fanatic. Meek Mill or Hall & Oates? Meek Mill. Dr. J or Allen Iverson throwback jersey? Allen Iverson throwback jersey. Liberty Bell or Rocky Steps? Rocky Steps. The six-pack of questions brought to you by Garage Beer. Beer Beer-flavored beer. Find some near you at drinkgaragebeer.com. All right, I'm delving now into my music library. I'm going to give you a handful of artists from that library. You tell me if you have them in your library. Are you ready? Okay. Jill Scott. Yes. Finn Lizzy. No. Travis Scott. Yes. Garth Brooks. Yes. Cypress Hill. Yes. I figure you probably have some country because did you have a ranch for a while with horses and all yep. of that? Absolutely. Whatever, Spent a whatever, lot of time whatever happened? Whatever Miami. happened there? Well, you know, I was tra- when I retired. The transition for me, I was traveling around the country competing in rodeos. So, um, really I was doing what? The Cowboys. Uh, this event called team roping. We have a uh, one guy on a horse, and you know another guy, and or another person. Sorry, and they let the steer go, and I was a header, which means I had to rope the steer around the head. Turn him a little bit, and then my partner would rip, rip, rip him by the feet. That's called team. And whoever did the fastest won. So I traveled the country competing in team roping. Um, went as far as Wyoming, Reno, Nevada. Uh, uh, went to a lot of places competing in rodeos. It was outstanding. So, yeah, I was around a lot of real country, uh, real cowboys that put me on country music. Sounds like you may have learned that growing up in North Philly. Uh, well, my family, my, my I'm grandmother's joking. family. I'm South joking. I'm joking. Well, my grandma's family's from South Carolina. Okay. So they, they live in the ranch. All right. All so, right. So, yeah, I used to go there a lot. So, yes. <laughs> All right. Let's go back to North Philly. Tell me what life was like uh, for you growing up. Well, you know, um, for me, life was hard. You know, I was poverty stricken. I grew up in a house with no heat, no running water in the middle of North Philadelphia. We was very poor. Um, what I did eat was mostly tasty cakes or honey buns because they were cheap. Quarter waters were cheap. Uh, and, you know, so I think it was periodic of years where I don't think I had a meal, a square meal. Uh, a lot of it was like 
candy because I find a quarter, I find a dollar, take it to the corner store and just get whatever I kick, as much I, uh, food I can get for that. Um, my version of a meal for the first 10 years of my life might have been when I could save a dollar twenty five, get a dollar twenty five, and go to this, this the corner store and get uh, three five chicken wings and fries. So that was my meal. So that was me growing up in North Philly a lot. We got a lot of fights, and things like that, um, because it's rough. Um, and I'm I'm the 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 person who should have been, who could have been a statistic. And because I've seen so much negativity around me, I was smart enough to use it as a positive. Where I say I don't want to do that. So because I don't want to do that, I did the opposite of things, and that's why I was able to reach the success I had. What got you to make that decision, though? Just watching to see how drugs um, affected my family, how it destroyed mm. my family. Mm. Uh, you know, at one point, all my grandmother, grandmother children was, unfortunately, it was, on, uh, the, it was during the crack epidemic, and it was all on drugs. And I seen how it went. we had a great family. My grandmother was was an incredible grandmother. She She took care of all of us, and... Unfortunately, at one point, all her children were on drugs. Mm. And I just see how it destroyed our entire family. At what point, Mark, did you realize that basketball could be a way out for you? Uh, I believe for the first time I tested basketball, the gentleman who lived in my mother's neighborhood, who seen me sit on the step because I wasn't allowed to move from the step. Mm. And he would take me, he would take me at some my age, he used to go workers out. And I used to just work out playing basketball with him. And he was like he was he was like a drill sergeant, but it taught me discipline. It taught me to work hard. It taught me to be tough. Um, it was that, and then it went to it was that, and then it went to uh, when I got to around thirteen, fourteen. I started playing playing in the schoolyard, and I seen a movie. I don't know what movie. I don't think, I can't remember. It was about Wilt, or who was about like a little on a local TV show movie, and I heard I, I heard Mark Ivoroni's name. Mm on the TV and I said, a guy in the NBA has my name. <laughs> and I put those two things, yeah, I was that naive. And then I said, put those two things together and that made me want to play basketball. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah. Um, so you end up at Roman Catholic, which is you mm -hmm. know pretty close to City Hall, Broad and Vine. And then about a mile or so up North Broad Street, you play collegiately at Temple, but yet you made a, a, a stop somewhere else for a year. You ended up going to yes. Virginia Commonwealth what happened yep. there, and why didn't you stay there? Went to Virginia Commonwealth, was recruited really heavy, went there. They showed me our love. First day on the campus, I knew it was the wrong decision. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it was the wrong decision when I'm working out with the assistant coach. And I never lived wasted. He put 225 on a bar, and he says, you can get it. And he let it fall on my chest. And he fractured my sternum. So at that point, I said, yeah, this ain't the place for me. But I stayed for the year. Um, it actually wasn't bad. It was The school was... At that point, I believe, at that time, I think Virginia County was the number one commuter school in the country, which I didn't know. So Monday through Thursday, the school was booming. It was a great campus, great life. Everybody's like family. But then Thursday afternoon to Monday morning, it was a ghost town because mm. nobody lived on campus. So, uh, you know, those things, combination, and we was we was an okay team. We took a, a hit. We lost a lot of games in a row. And I said, I think I'm better than this. And I bet on myself and transferred to Temple. Uh, was John Cheney uh, active in that? Did he get word and sort of put the bug in your ear? How did all that happen? So when I was coming out of high school, Coach Cheney was not recruiting me because Coach Cheney believed in recruiting one player in a position. And at that time, he was trying to recruit Rasheed Wallace, who blames him. Yeah, so right. when I went to Virginia Commonwealth and he knew I was, I was going to transfer, I originally was going to transfer to St. Joe's. But um, my coach, my summer league coach, John Harnett, I said, I think Temple's a better school. It's a top 25 team in the country. They produce some pros, and you will start immediately if you work hard. But I said, they got all front court seniors. He's like, you're better than all of them. And I bet on myself, and I know how hard I worked, and I transferred there, and they had uh, their whole first, their whole four, four, and five men was all seniors. And I outworked them, and coach trusted me enough to start me, and that's how I went. What is the one, and I'm sure you had a lot of takeaways from Coach Cheney. He was great in so many ways, not only as a coach, but a mentor. What's the one thing that tops the list of all the things you took from him and the, and the years that you knew him and played for him? I'm no better than anyone else. No one is beneath anyone. No one's above anyone. We are all equals. How you live your life and the mindset, the way you live it, dictates your future and dictates your way of life and your happiness. Just remember that.
And that's what I took most of the machining. How does that serve you now, for example? So I, I think the, the best thing about me, if I can speak about me, frankly, is as I make sure I make connections, I make sure I speak to every single person I pass in the street, in the elevator, or anywhere in the gym. I think it's important to venture out and meet new people. I'm big in the culture. I'm big in the other people's culture. Everyone has a story. And I try to find as many stories as I can throughout the course of a day and try to interact with them. So that's how it helps me now. What about the haters on the street or on social media? Do you try to interact with them too? No, I don't. I, I don't. I just understand everyone's value to their opinion. As long as you're respectful, and if you're not I'm respectful, I just cut you off. But if it comes to a point where, you, you know, you're not, I just ignore you. That's part of life. But everyone is entitled to their opinion. Everyone doesn't have to agree with you. And I don't look at it as trying to change people's mind. I look at it as exchange of information. If you look at your daily life, when you interact with people who don't necessarily believe what you believe, it's an exchange of information. And then that's how you live life. And then even the haters who understand, they're not necessarily hating. That's what they think. And you have to respect them. You were drafted in the second round by Golden State, yet you went overseas. You played in Turkey, Spain. At one point, you even played for a Russian team. And I should say mm -hmm. more accurately, your NBA career was bookended by playing overseas uh, mm -hmm. before the NBA and again afterwards. Our choice. And, and it helped. I mean, you were third in Rookie of the Year voting when you came back to the NBA. Um, but, just, but, 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 just, but by ahead. the Volick Awards, but, but by the Volick Awards, which is the ESPYs before they changed the name, I was NBA Rookie of the Year. Oh, is sure that right? Fit. Oh, wow. Yes, that's okay. a fact. Mm -hmm. Wow. I, I appreciate that. So, mm -hmm. uh, and, and then eventually you're, you're <laughs> traded to the Sixers. It was a multi-team deal. Yes. It involved Glenn Robinson, coming to the Sixers in the same deal. And it was a crazy year, too. 2003-04, Larry Brown's tenure ended the previous season. Randy Ayers, his noted assistant, lasted about half the season, maybe less. And it was Chris Ford. And Allen Iverson was out of the lineup a lot because of injury. What a crazy year. And yet your home, was it good for you to be home? Because for some players, Ooh, it's not a good That's a great time. question. Great question. I'm actually working on writing a book about my stay in Spain for Philly. Oh, wow. So, okay. Yeah. So uh, the interesting thing about that is, Mark, I love being home. I love being here. But I have a lot of teammates who from here who couldn't stand. They couldn't take the pressure. They couldn't t take the access that people had from them, uh, for, to them. They hated it. I loved it. Because I remember what got me involved in basketball. And everybody's different, Mark. I'm a little different, too. Like, I'm not afraid. I'm not going to say that. I'm a little different, meaning I understand everyone's not your friend. I understand that some people want more. I'm saying you can't trust everyone, right? So with that being said, me personally, I enjoyed it because I know it was a dream come true to me. You, you Mark, you would not believe how many days, I, how many times I cried when I would put on that six jersey. Wow. You guys, Kenny Thomas. Kenny Thomas' locker is next to mine. How many days I put on my lock, my jersey, and I had to go to the bathroom to cry? Because I understood where I was and where I'm at. And every time I put play those images back in my head, it would just bring so much joy to my heart. Wow. Uh, eventually, you retired in 2009. You became a broadcaster, of course. You, you've Again, you're doing great work on, on TV. Uh, what else are you doing? I know that you're involved with coaching, mentoring. You're very active with your foundation. Tell me about your foundation and what the mandate is. Yes, my, my foundation is named Jackals Foundation, and it's about mentoring, teaching the youth of today, giving kids, uh, children, a different eyes on the world, and how can they adventure out and just be more cultured in the world and see more things, and how basketball, or not basketball, can help you see more of the world. I think it's very important. People need to appreciate other people's culture. You need to put yourselves in other people's shoes and experience things. It makes you more well-rounded. And I bring that to the, to the youth that I mentor. And I think this is very important because if it, I wish I had that when I was growing up. And I still do public speaking. I'm still a keynote speaker, a public speaker motivator. Um, I do a lot of that. A lot of that. I really enjoy it. I speak to anyone. Anyway, I speak in corporate events. I speak to youth. Last week, I spoke, spoke at Forbes headquarters for the keynote speaker for the global uh, sales meeting. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I enjoy it. These are things I do because I like to brighten people, give people a different look on life. It don't have to be something that 
necessarily is better than your own outlook, just a different outlook. And once again, exchange of information. Uh, and I'm big on that and I really enjoy it. Mark, you're 49 years old. What's yes, on sir. the horizon for you? You know what, Mark, that's a great question. I love doing 60 grand posts, but now that my children are getting older, I'm also looking for more to do different things. One thing, I, but while I continue doing Sixers pre and post, I'm looking to dabble into different entities and different things. I'm also a, a lecturer for Rowan University in, Rowan in New Jersey, uh, just about in sports media and just uh, give her an athlete, athlete's point of view of life and sports, as well as take how it is put me in the media category, as well as, um, I like to be put in rooms I have no idea what I'm, I'm doing and then mastering it. That's always been a thing of me. Once again, learning new things, making myself more complete, more whole, but venturing out, trying more things. I'm not afraid to fail, but the only way to master something is to fail at it first. Mark Jackson, Mark with a C, like me. The only way to spell it. <laughs> thank, you, my, thank you, my friend, for being with us on Fresh 24. My man, thank you, brother. Hey guys, thanks for listening to this episode of Fresh 24. Please subscribe, rate, and review wherever you get your podcasts. Check out our friends over at Philadelphia Sports Nation, a local Philadelphia sports site covering your favorite teams across blogs and social media. phlsportsnation.com, Philadelphia Sports Nation, PHL Sports Nation, enhancing your Philadelphia sports fan experience.